Well, this is the beginning of Holy Week, what is called Holy Week. Today is considered Palm Sunday when, when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem and there were crowds of people who had, had so much hope in him. There, there was some, it was just super exciting, like a really exciting time. And, and the place was a buzz, right? And, and they, had, they had seen and heard how Jesus had, had raised a man from the dead, a very, very dead man by the name of Lazarus. They had seen him raise him from the dead and Jesus had not been arrested yet right so there's so much excitement and so much hope in what Jesus might be able to do he had healed a, a man who had been born blind he had stood up to the religious leaders he had called himself the son of God he called himself the Messiah it was an exciting day and the Passover festival was was beginning but even in these exciting times, even in these scenes that were unfolding, there were glimpses of some strange things that were also happening. Like, if Jesus is going to be this great military political powerhouse, instead of riding in on a horse, he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. But whatever, it's, it's still Jesus, right? <laughs> He's going to fix all this stuff. And once again, all the people, they would have the power again. The power to choose their own destiny. I mean, this is how exciting it was. And you can feel the electricity in the air. I think sometimes it's, it's kind of hard for us. When we, really, when we read Bible stories or, and we get into them, I think it's really hard for us to really, really comprehend what they were going through in that setting. See, these were people who were, who were basically under the oppressive rule and control of the Roman Empire. There were laws and expectations that came when Rome invaded your homeland. There were spies and traitors. There were those who would exploit the situation. And they longed. They were desperate for things to be made right again. And you can imagine, with all of that, there were probably even those who desired to pay back the Romans for the pain that they had, they had inflicted on them. You ever notice, though, that vicious cycle that violence always, always brings with it? See, the raw reality is there will never be enough revenge to heal the wounds we carry from others. There will never be enough revenge to heal the wounds we carry from others. It will just become layer upon layer. And, and the way that the Roman soldiers had treated them. I mean, to think of these people and these people in, in Jerusalem and, and the Jewish people, they were longing for someone who had the power to drive the enemy out. The problem was that the real enemy was not where they thought it was. The real enemy works from within and in the shadows of the hearts and minds of people. The real enemy tricks and manipulates people into chains of confusion about who they are and why they exist. The real enemy uses our weaknesses to fool us into thinking that what is killing us somehow is helping us. And we end up plugging our lives into sources that produce self-destructive, relationship-killing behaviors and ways of living. You don't have to look far to see it. Even today, greed, gossip, mistrust, 
dehumanization, hypersexuality, hyper religiosity, hate, racism, hypocrisy. Have I said something that all of us might be able to relate to? Each of these lead to death in some way, shape, or form. And all of these things point to the fact that when we plug our lives into the wrong source, we make a mess of things. When we plug our lives into it. But here's the deal. Here is the hope we have if we are willing to receive it. Jesus came to deal with the real enemy, which is sin and death. Matters of the heart determine the ultimate outcome of our lives. See, the deal with the, with the real enemy, to deal with the real enemy, you need a real solution. All the bombs, all the guns, all of the elections, we will never do what Jesus can do. And Jesus is ushering in a new reality, this new kingdom that is very much still arriving today. This new life when, when God rules and, and where evil and sin and death are finally overcome. When Jesus arrives on the scene, he is the beginning of the new life that God was bringing about. A new life that can restore what it really means to be human. And here's the beauty. It happens one person at a time. The kingdom comes to us through the form of Jesus in us. When we begin this new life with Jesus... It starts by us being able to see how God is working all around us. And it's exciting, right? We've all been there. Like, if you haven't, it's a great place to be. You start seeing the possibilities. You start seeing the possibilities. But you also start to see a world that, that might exist without God. And at first, we're all tempted to try and use that, that old world way of thinking. We, we, start to, we, we, we try to use that to make things right. Like those who first encountered Jesus and wanted him to be their ticket to power. They wanted Jesus to be their ticket. They thought Jesus was their ticket to power to making things better through political and military and violent ways. But see, Jesus, Jesus had begun to work closely with this handful of disciples. He had begun to teach and show them this new reality, this new life. And they didn't completely understand it, but they were listening, and they were listening with their hearts they fell in love with Jesus. They were friends. And Jesus is really asking a lot of them. He is asking them to trust him. That all they had learned before meeting him, that all the noise and the temptations to try and make God into something that he wasn't, that to keep seeing God just through the lens of, of these rules that they had had all their lives wasn't going to really help them. Because all the rules were keep, would keep an intimate relationship with God just out of reach. You ever wish you could, um, you ever wish you could know somebody, maybe they're really important and they're famous and you wish you could get to know them. You're like, you ever see somebody that you're like, if I knew them, I bet we would be good friends. A famous person. You ever thought that? But you know that because of who they are and who you are, you probably won't ever have a good relationship. Ever have that? Yeah? Well, I was in a meeting the other day. We, our our um, pastoral team went and met with another pastoral team at a church here in, uh, in the Charlotte area. And, and, and we were getting together and, and talking and sharing ideas and plans. And, and it was really awesome. I mean, this staff, this church staff that we met with, I mean, they were cool people, right? I was like, man... Even their shoes were cool, right? They were just really cool people. And, and, and the lead pastor was talking, and, and he, was, he mentioned he, he knew this other pastor who's really famous. At least in my circles, he's really famous. And his name is Erwin McManus. And I'll tell you right now, this guy, Erwin McManus, I have listened to his stuff for years. His, his way of communicating has really molded and helped to, to impact my life and, and the way I communicate. 
And one time, even, in fact, I can remember this was several years ago. I was trying Twitter, and uh, he was on Twitter, and I, I, I put out a, a tweet, and I mentioned him in it, and he hearted it. He liked it. And I was so excited, and I called Becky, and I called my friends. I said, Erwin McManus, he saw it. And one time I was in L.A., and I even took a picture outside of his church. I didn't go in. I just took a picture outside of his church. This is so awesome. So awesome. But I was in this meeting a couple of weeks ago, and this guy, this other pastor, had said that Erwin had been his mentor, like real-life mentor. And I was like, whoa. And we got to the end of the meeting, and, and we were exchanging pleasantries, and we were praying for each other. And, and they said, is there anything, you know, we could do for you guys? And I sat there for a minute, and I thought... I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to go for it. I said, could you introduce me to Erwin McManus? And he's like, you wish, buddy. <laughs> Man, if only. And I, you know, I will probably never be in the same room with that guy. He will always be at a distance because of who he is and who I am. And this relationship that the Jewish people had had with God was very similar. Because of who they were, because of the fact that, that they would never be clean enough, they would never be good enough, it was always a gamble. Would, they sac would their sacrifice be enough? And on top of that, the idea that God would do something beyond them to other people outside of their faith where people didn't even have to become part of their faith and keep all their rules. And that God would do it in a very intentional way was beyond their wildest imagination. They never thought they could know God in that way, to know him intimately, to have a relationship with him like that. And then Jesus comes along and shows them what God is willing to do to break through all the noise, to break through all of that stuff, that, that, that shell that they had put around themselves. And Jesus says, and we talked about this last week in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. We talked about this last week. God is no longer distant. The way to a relationship with God is no longer through a religion. The way is Jesus. We talked about this. I, one of my favorite preachers said, Jesus is what God looks like. And Jesus brings God to such an intimate level to us by referring to God even as Father. Jesus is the way to know God. Jesus is the truth about God. Jesus is, listen to this, Jesus is the life that God wants to put inside of us so that we can also reveal to the world around us how much God does love this world. So this is where we're going to pick up this week's I Am statement of Jesus. Last week we talked about how Jesus was trying to get his disciples ready for what was about to happen to him and to them. They had just had a, a dinner where Jesus washed their feet. Jesus talked about how one of them was, was going to betray him and hand him over. Jesus talked about how one of them was going to deny he even knew who Jesus was. It was the last dinner and Jesus would, that Jesus would have with them, and, and he, even, he, even serves, um, he even serves those he knows are going to fail. It's kind of heavy stuff, right? And there's a lot of confusion. And after Jesus tells them that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, he tells them it's going, that, that he, him leaving, him going away is a good thing. Because he would send them his spirit and they will do greater things. And then in, in that last part of chapter 14 in the book of John, he goes into a little more detail about the Holy Spirit and, and what the Holy Spirit will do. And Jesus is really starting to drive the point about who he is home. This is the authentic Jesus. Trying to get his disciples to know and understand who he is and why they can trust that he is who he is. 
And so he says, and we're going to look in, in the New Testament book of John, chapter 15, starting in verse 1, this last I am statement, Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. He's talking to his disciples here. He says to them, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Would you read that? Let's do that one again. Say that with me. Ready? Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. He goes on to say, Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Once again, and we talked about this, when, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, he, he uses this language, he uses the is illustrations that they would have been very familiar with, it would have, that, that would have really connected with them. And it was common for the people of Israel to even refer to themselves as the vine. As the vine. They were supposed to be the vine that was revealing who God was. But over and over again, they continue to have these issues where they get off track. In fact, they probably would have remembered the words that they'd heard growing up or in the synagogue from Psalms chapter 80 where speaking about Israel, it says, you brought us from Egypt like a grapevine. You drove away the pagan nations and transplanted us into your land. You cleared the ground for us, and we took root and filled the land. Our shade covered the mountains. Our branches covered the mighty cedars. We spread out our branches west to the Mediterranean Sea. Our shoots spread east to the Euphrates River. But now, why have you broken down our walls so that all who pass by may steal our fruit? The wild boar from the forest devours it. The wild animals feed on it. Come back, we beg you, O God of heaven's armies. This is his prayer. Look down from heaven and see our plight. Take care of this grapevine that you yourself have planted. This son you have raised for yourself. This is how they saw themselves as a people. And so Jesus now is saying this. He's, he's saying that, see, once and for all, everything that Israel was supposed to be is completely found in him. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine. Everything that God wants humankind to know about who he is is found in Jesus. Jesus says, God is the gardener. God is the one who has started a new vine out of the old vine. But this new vine is everything that the old couldn't accomplish. Somebody was telling me the other day, this whole process, I don't know if you're familiar with grafting or not, where, where you can take the, uh, a, a, a living a plant and you can you can a tree and you can take an, a branch or you can take another living piece and you can put it together and you can put them together and they grow out of it if you do it right connect it right it's an amazing process right and out of that process new growth occurs so Jesus is saying that he is the true vine and that everyone who believes in him are like branches and that God does this work in those who are connected to him in order that they will produce fruit. So there, there's a couple of things here that are important. This concept of Jesus being the true vine. Again, Jesus is preparing them for what's ahead, right? Right? It's going to get rocky. 
It's going to get stormy. It's going to get confusing. There's going to be a bunch of uh, uh, powerful religious leaders that are scared to believe in Jesus. There's a powerful empire whose emperor considers himself God. And so for those disciples, their connectedness to Jesus matters now more than ever because their connectedness will determine who they will become. See, God had already begun a work in their lives by hearing and receiving the words Jesus was giving them, by showing them how God's purpose was being revealed in and through him. See, the light bulb was already starting to, starting to, to have a little bit of light in it, <laughs> starting to go off. They weren't totally get there yet. Now, I was talking to somebody this week. I was having a great conversation with a, a person who is, who is starting in their faith journey, and they're, they're beginning, and they're seeking, and they're searching. And, and we talked about um, uh, that whole process. And I said to him, I said, you are finding the way. You're finding the way. See, Jesus has already showed up, and now God is going to do more. We use a word, it's, it's quite churchy, but... It's a word called sanctification. There is more that God wants to do in our lives. And the word pruning here can also be translated as cleansing. See, if we are willing to stay connected to Jesus, God will do the work in our lives. He will do the work of showing us areas that need some changes. He will do the work of helping us to become more and more like Jesus. That is what the fruit will be. See, the type of fruit will always be dependent on the type of vine, right? So everybody, can we all agree on that? That's, that's a, that's a no-brainer. The fruit will be the life of Jesus in us. It's the life of Jesus revealed uniquely in each one of us. But let's be clear. We can disconnect ourselves from the vine. We can choose to walk away. We can choose to plug ourselves up to something or someone else. We can choose to plug our lives into the noise and the distractions of this world. We can choose to plug our lives into the news channels and radio stations and social media. Mm. About a year ago, I had to make a conscious decision to limit my expo exposure to the noise. And I don't mean to be unkind, but I had to decide I love some people too much to be their friends on social media. <laughs> I had to limit how much gossip I allowed to get near my mind and heart because I knew the truth. I knew the truth about how God felt about me. And I wanted to stay connected to the true vine instead of to people's sad opinions, all right? And I'm really glad I did, even though it was tough. I sat down with a, with a pastoral counselor, and we were talking, and we were at meeting, and, and I laid out some of the stuff that I had, had happened, all my disappointments, and he asked me, he said, Aaron, what do you want to become? Who do you want to become in life? I said, well, I, I want to be a a compassionate person. I want my kids to be compassionate and generous. I want to be patient and kind. I said all those things, you know. And he said to me, he said, do you think maybe, do you think maybe through this, God is helping you to become more like that? I sat back. I should have thought about that. <laughs> I said, no, I really hadn't thought about that. Now, I think we should be careful thinking that things we might be going through are caused by God, but I certainly believe they can be used by God. Whether it is to try and get us to come back to Him or to show us places in our lives that are keeping us from being more loving like Jesus. Here's the deal, though. If we want to disconnect our lives from him, God will not stop us. Notice it says, anyone who does not remain in me, right? That's what the scripture says. Just like it takes a choice to remain in Jesus, 
to remain connected, it also is a choice to disconnect. I came across this, this, uh, this was in particular about this scripture. Someone was writing about it and they said, the father's pruning knife then severs not the weak or faltering believer from his Lord, but the branch which has already inwardly entirely severed itself from the life-giving and fruit-producing flow of the vine. I don't want to be out of the flow of the vine, right? Let's keep going. This is back to John 15, picking up in verse nine. Jesus continues, he says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved you. Remain in my love. Would you say that with me? Remain in my love. He goes on, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command, say it with me, love each other. Now, maybe this can help us to know what the fruit is Jesus is talking about. It's interesting because there is a difference between a command and a mandate. Once again, you can walk away from a command. But to walk away from this command is walking away from a relationship with God. To walk away from loving each other is to choose to disobey the command of Jesus. Mm. I was in a meeting not too long ago and we were discussing the polarization in our country. I had read an article about how people are moving to places where they are surrounded by people who are all just like them. They don't want to be around people they disagree with. And it's happened in churches. It's happened, it's happened in churches for a long time, well beyond just the last 10 years. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that Sunday morning at 11 a.m. is the most segregated hour in Christian America. I want to tell you something. The early church was not segregated. The church should be a place where rich and poor, young and old, and every skin color you can think of can come together. And through the power of Jesus, love each other. If the God of all the universe, a God who is so perfect and so holy, can step down into my, into our ugly mess of things and be willing to call us friends, be willing to die for us. He even says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Don't you think, don't you think we could find a way to love each other? Don't you think we could find a way for Christian Republicans, Christian Democrats, Christian Independents, if don't you think we could find a way? Because if we can't find a way, then what does it say about who we are really connected to? Who does it say? In Jesus' name, we must find a way to love each other. Jesus makes it clear. Continuing in verse 16, I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Listen, we march to the drumbeat of our Savior's love. That's how we live. If there's anything I want you to remember to this today is this. When our lives are really connected to the life of Jesus, 
God does whatever it takes to produce more of his love in us. That's what it means. Would you stand? I want us to move into a time of reflection. Bow your heads, close your eyes. I hope you've been listening for the voice of God to speak to you today, to challenge you, to encourage you. And so I want to ask you, if you're watching online, I want you to answer this question too in your heart, in your mind. Are you connected to Jesus? Is your life plugged into Jesus? Is your life producing this fruit of love? Are you making a conscious decision to remain in Jesus, to remain in his love? Today, if you don't know him, I invite you, whether you know what this all means or not, give him a chance. You don't have to have it all completely understood, but start. Maybe just start with a prayer. Jesus, I want my life plugged into yours. I want my life connected to you. Start there. Let the Spirit of God take just that willingness of your heart. And then start seeking. Start learning what it means to remain. Maybe today you plugged your life into a lot of different sources. Maybe you've listened to gossip. Maybe you've become cynical and you've lost the warmth. You've lost the joy, right? That's a warning sign. Jesus says, I will give you my joy. If you've lost the joy, God is saying, wake up. Come back. Reconnect. Is your life producing the fruit of love today? Oh God, I feel and sense you moving in this place, speaking to our hearts. You've been speaking to mine all week long. I don't, I don't say these words without areas that I know that you are moving in in my life, changing and shaping and molding. As a church, God, we want to be your church, known for your love, known for your grace, known for your mercy, a place where we can see healing taking place. Healing in families. Healing among the different types of people. because we want to be known as your followers. We want that Jesus. And you have given us your very life so that we could be these kinds of people who remain in you, who remain in your love. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.